Um, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the, the latest in, the, in our active travel webinar series with Engineers Ireland and the NTA. Today we have, um, we're lucky to have Robert Burns, who's Director of Services with the Leary uh, County Council, and Andreas Sal Rutna, um, who's with NTA. Um, and Robert is responsible for the management and delivery of infrastructure, public realm, active travel and climate action related projects. He's led on the council's mobility and public realm projects and carried out in response to COVID and most notably the development of a five kilometer coastal route over three months in the summer of 2020, um, as well as lots of village renewal projects in Blackrock, Dundrum, Dockey and Glastool. He has a wide range of interests in the fields of transportation, mobility and town and village renewal and climate action. And Andreas is a qualified architect from Denmark with expense, extensive sorry, experience as a client and consultant for urban realm projects and strategy developed development and he's worked in the UK, Denmark and Ireland and on national and international projects. His slides will be a presentation of, in, of urban realm relative to active tra transport, specifically in the Bus, Bus Connects project and proposals that the NTA have worked out rather than um, a presentation of any adopted, say, NTA principles, but it'll be very interesting. So that'll be really good too. Okay, um, Robert's going to kick off, kick us off. So, Robert. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Engineers Ireland and the NTA for organising this seminar um, series. It's, it's very timely. Um, a lot of the feedback I've heard has been very good. Um, a number of colleagues have presented on that and done it down as well. But I think it's really important that uh, there are people who are doing work in this area that are giving back and helping to um, disseminate both information and good practice about active travel. I think what's also important to remember is that uh, active travel isn't something that's going to be a fad for a number of years. This is here to stay. And we'll be looking to build and develop networks over the next number of years. It ties in not only with sustainable mobility, but also with climate action. So it's going to be a key uh, part of infrastructure development over the next number of years. As Fano says, I'm a director of service in Dunleary Down County Council. I'm an engineer by profession. so. Uh, there may be a valid question as to why I'm presenting on urban design, but uh, the way I would put it is um, that actually it's about an understanding and an appreciation of urban design, and not everybody can be an architect or an urban designer. So it's important to come at it from maybe the layman's point of view, understand and appreciate the need for it. So that's just an outline of what I'm going to go through. Um, so I'll just move on through an introduction. And I suppose in different times we might have had an interactive piece at the start, or I know technology allows it, but I think maybe um, something to to just ponder, it's not something to answer in the chat or question function, is you know, which of these two questions do we think are more likely to have positive responses? You know, if you ask you know people in a village or a town or a member of you know just any local community, would they like cycle lanes going through their village or town? Or do they like their town or village to have less traffic? nice of public spaces and to be a place where it's easier and safer to walk and cycle around. But I think in Judah, we think most people would probably uh, opt for the second one. And that's important because I think we need to think about how we frame active travel, how we discuss and communicate with communities, residents, businesses, because it isn't just simply about a cycle lane or even mobility, there's a lot more going on. And I would argue that active travel is not about an ideology. Sometimes it is framed in that way. And it's not about a political perspective. It's not the preserve of any political party. It's part of a strategy to support compact development, social equity, economic prosperity, and to make our public spaces more livable and climate resilient. And people may have a, a different point of view, but that's the way I come at it. And I think just in terms of looking at this as well, an urban design, so two very eminent people in this whole area of urban design and livability. Um, Janet Sadiq Khan is a former New York City Transport Commissioner and probably one of the most car-centric cities in the world. She, she managed to prosper and think about a, a whole host of changes, including pedestrianization of part of Times Square. And she said that every city resident is a pedestrian at some point in the day. A city who streets invites people to walk, bike and sit down at, then also inspires people to innovate, invest, and to stay for good. So we're opening up this wider concept that maybe moving around 
by walking and cycling is part of a wider those objective to make our places more livable, if you like. And I love this quote from Jan Gell. And, you know, it's also saying it's interesting to see which cities of the world are on the list of livable cities. They're always the cities that are sweet to their people. It's a lovely way of putting it. We, we don't often hear that kind of language in Ireland. And then, you know, just to continue that sort of quote thing, um, Chartier, who's a French philosopher, talked about ideas and he said, nothing is more dangerous than an, an idea when it's the only one you have. And I suppose what I'm getting at there is that the idea of prioritizing private vehicle movements for many years has been our idea in, in this country. And I suppose the challenge for us now is to unwind that, to facilitate active travel, more livable communities, make our, our cities and urban spaces and indeed our communities more climate resilient. So in terms of strategy, vision and implementation, so where I'm going here is we need to look at the big picture. We need to start uh, at a high level and work down through. And I guess most of you are probably aware there's quite a lot of policy in this area in active travel. Some of it relates to um, urban design, some of it not so much so, but it's something to have regard to. And you know, there's a whole host of there and many other presentations I've been at have gone through this and I think you're probably well aware of it. But it's important to say that there are national plans, national strategies, and every county has its own plans. So you've got a county development plan, a climate change plan. Some regions even have their own cycle network plans like Dublin and Cork. But I think, you know, things don't stay the same either. We really need to think about what's going to come come next. We know about the Climate Change and Low Car Carbon Act that was just passed in the summer. What's going to be the impact of the Climate Action Plan? It's likely to be uh, set in the, in the coming months. What about carbon budgets? There's a lot of discussion about those at the moment. And what will the transport sector carbon budget look like? Because in a way, from a climate perspective, this will be the same as a, or the equivalent of a financial budget. We're going to have to work within our means and if there is a certain transport sector carbon budget set for Ireland or for this Dublin or for various local authorities, how are we going to stay within that and active travel will be critical to that as well in terms of ensuring modal shift and moving away from um, modes of transport that are, are resulting in much higher emissions. And then when we think of strategy in active travel, we need to think about in Dublin is the, is the Greater Dublin Area Cycle Network Plan in Cork. They have their own cycle network plan. And other counties and towns and cities will be developing those as they go. So there's just an example of Dublin and um, drilling down into the detail um, for, for the near that done. And it's really important because it's telling us two things. One, that there's a strategy and two, that there's a network. The network is the most important concept that we have when it comes to active travel ties in very closely with safety but it tells you that we're not just going to do parts of something we want cohesion and that brings me on to those five sort of iconic principles from the dutch flow cycling design manual we talk about cohesion um, networks if you like directness making sure that you don't have to go too far uh, people will always choose the fastest route unless there's a more comfortable or safer route that might take them slightly longer safety is critical Dutch design principles look at the difference between speed and mass uh, and segregate on the basis of, of higher speeds uh, between vulnerable users and, and vehicles. And comfort, something we probably don't give a lot of uh, thought to, but you know, have we good surfacing? Are we minimizing stops or junctions? Are we removing nuisance, for example, like noise or fumes? And attractiveness, again, this probably brings us back to um, the whole concept of urban design. And it is a key part of active travel design. And so for me, these are the two areas that overlap the most between active travel and urban design. So it's comfort and attractiveness. The others, of course, link in. Um, but that sort of sets the scene, if you like, in terms of the strategy, the network, and these design principles that underpin the network. And Strategy is one of those words I think that is often used and bandied about. Um, and I wouldn't presume to have um, you know, the definitive uh, 
um, meaning of, of, of the term. But for me, what's, what's a working definition is working from the whole to the part. You have to set out something at a high level, be that a jigsaw to work out what it is you need to put together to make the whole. But working from the whole to the part. And a very influential writer, Joel Barker, who wrote about paradigm shift in the 70s and 80s and a uh, very important thinker in the world of business, was talking about action. If, it's, if you don't have action, it's only a dream. Um, and action without vision just passes the time. And vision with action can change the world. And some people might think that's quite a twee uh, quote, but I actually think it's very relevant because sometimes we're very busy doing things that don't uh, link into something bigger. And other times we're thinking about it, talking about it, planning on it, carrying out consultation, but we don't actually carry out any action. So the two need to come together. And that holds to the part. And so to put it into practice, and what I've done here is try to link it in with something that I understand and that I know, and hopefully you'll be able to relate to. So the Linear Town has a country development plan, like all other local authorities. Cities have a city development plan. Ours is running up until the end of next year. We're in the process of preparing a new plan. And within that, we have an urban framework plan. So that sets out uh, in a little bit more detail how we plan to carry out changes within Dunleary and connect it to the town, the harbour, and look at like, concepts around place and mobility and, and connectivity. And at the heart of this is this, this is Venn diagram that looks at how we can, in the case of Dunleary, create synergy between town centre and the waterfront, look at place making and creating vitality, and strengthening links with adjoining areas. Now, this plan is probably over 10 years old at this stage, so a lot of the work has been done on it. So because we have a strategy and a framework plan, we've been able to pick off projects as we've gone along over the last 15 years. And you can see the older projects we've done, the metals people will be familiar with that, that's down to Pavilion, the Lexicon, Lexicon, Works in the People's Park, the Leary Baths, which is nearing completion, and right up to last year when we were working on the Coastal Mobility Route, Black Rock, Glasgow, Munster and Gulfies. Now, they were prompted by, by COVID um, last year, but there was no reason why we couldn't tie that in to what is an already existing plan and work within that. And in terms of our current projects, we're doing the pedestrianisation in, in Georgia Street Law. We've done work on St. Michael's Square around the church and Myrtle Square, which is our new sort of flagship public space. Now, this is very much about where I work and what I understand, but I think you probably could relate to it for your own town, for your own county. I mean, are you aware of this strategy or vision for your own town or county or city? And are you doing work within that? Or is it just maybe work that's a little bit fractured or piecemeal? And for us in Dunleary, the key driver is to create synergies between the town and the waterfront, the two key areas for us. East Pier is one of the most iconic locations in Ireland, thousands of visitors each year. Um, the harbour itself, a lot of users and visitors there. And then also we have the town and those streets that connect between the two. The LR Lexicon is one of the most visited libraries in Ireland. And then you can see how you come to implementation that actually the coastal mobility route is a clear manifestation of the strategy and the vision. It is tying up a whole lot of different elements, it's providing connectivity, it's looking at the idea of space and place, how that's defined. And it's moving us forward into having more sustainable transport, becoming more climate resilient. And the numbers there are very significant on it. Um, uh, over a year, I think we've measured now almost 2 million active travel trips between walking and cycling, and a peak in the summer there, 26 and a half thousand. And you know, these numbers are very significant because I think we all understand and know places like Walter Greenway and Mayo Greenway, and they're iconic and they're great, and I've been on them and enjoyed them very much. But they're probably a, a sixth, seventh, and eighth of what the numbers that are on the coast route. And that shows you the potential for, for urban uh, active travel, urban greenways, if you like, uh, because they're able to do a lot of the heavy lifting on shorter journeys and practical journeys, going to work, going to school, uh, social business, and so on. And it also has tied in very well with the work we've been doing in Dunleary. And actually that peak of 26,500 cyclists came 
in the end, towards the end of July when we had the pedestrianisation in Bonaire as well. So it's something we'll be looking at in terms of the analysis. Are there synergies now between the pedestrianisation and um, the coastal mobility rate? I think it's just important to point out too, um, and I regularly bring this up in any presentation I give, that there's a lot of pushback from hands on active travel projects and public ground projects too. But the research is very clear, um, very clear in the UK, throughout Europe, US, the public realm changes boost uh, retail activity and the local economy, sometimes by as much as 30%. And that's borne out time and again. It also shows that um, in this research, that businesses often overestimate uh, their customers' car use by a very significant amount, underestimate walking and public transport in particular, and to a degree cycling. And just to sort of look at a typical project, and the trial pedestrianisation is also part of our urban framework plan, right? because the future in Dunleer, while it's a trial and, and the future is still to be determined for a permanent pedestrianisation in Dunleer, it was still very much envisaged in the urban framework plan. So everybody's familiar with drawings, the, the line drawings and uh, the connectivity drawings, that are produced for a lot of projects. And we do that just like anyone else. And I would refer to those as the rational. We have that there, a bit more detail tells you how space is going to be used, maybe a little bit of detail around um, you know, where um, connections will be made, what are the pedestrianized areas, where you're putting in planters and so on. And people pay some attention to that and it's useful from a practical point of view. But it's really the emotional that people are engaged with. And that's my, my experience that you know, this is worth maybe a thousand line drawing or engineering drawing. People are now getting a sense of what this might look like. They're engaging with it. And that's the emotional. There's a connection formed with this vision of the street that goes way beyond the rational. You know, people now are putting themselves on that street, seeing what it might look like, how it might feel on the street. Likewise with Myrtle Square, it doesn't need to look like this. And these are only visuals or representations. And the, the, the actual can be very different. But it's giving a sense of what's possible. And just in, in Dunleary, in terms of the trial, there's some of the before and after um, photos. And you know, it has been transformed. And we've done that in a very short period of time. We started in early July. Uh, unfortunately, for, for some people, I think, uh, many people will be disappointed to know that the trial is ending. And the end of next week, but that's what we had committed to a three month trial. But it shows the potential, shows the possibility. And we're going to gather a lot of information, including qualitative data, surveys from users, businesses, residents, and hard data like air quality, noise monitoring, traffic, number of pedestrians on it. And over July and August, there was a 16% increase in football in Dunleary. And Dunleary is doing quite well beforehand. So pedestrianization does result in more people on the street. There are other questions around as a result of more retail sales. I mean, football doesn't always translate. But again, I guess as a local authority, our job is to bring people to the town. And we believe we we discharge that role, if you like, ensuring more football, uh, promoting that connectivity between the harbour and the town. And this is just to bring two photos together. Or sorry, one is the, the visual. And we started out, and that's an actual photo. And they're not a million miles apart. And, you know, there is that idea of the vision becoming the reality and this idea of thoughts becoming things. And in the second photo, you not only have you sort of 2D representation of it, you can show people how it's working, but those people who walked on that street, who sat down there, who've gone shopping on the street, who've, who've gone out at the nighttime, they have an experience of it. And that will be very valuable when it comes to uh, feedback or trying to understand what the future might hold for, for that whole area. Just in terms of engagement and collaboration, because it's really important, um, because urban designers don't stand on their own. They don't sit in a, in a, in a corner and work away and somehow give drawings or their, their visuals out to others. They really work, need to work as part of a multi, multidisciplinary team and across, across the uh, different departments. For an organization those, like us, I'd be referring to departments because it's one thing for, let's say, um, architects, engineers, um, lands uh, landscape architects, park superintendents, um, economists to work together. But it's actually another thing if they're 
it actually can be more beneficial if they are remaining in their departments and they're fueled by the work that's happening there. So architects are being fueled by the other ideas that are happening among their colleagues in architects, and then they come out into the multidisciplinary team and work there and then go back in again. So there is a subtle distinction between multidisciplinary and cross-departmental. Um, I'd say if you don't have an architect or an urban designer on any of your projects at the moment or in your team, get someone in pretty quickly, get that advice in, it'll be well worth it. Stakeholder engagement is really important before, during and after any plan changes. Um, key stakeholders for us in local authorities are councillors, public residents, businesses and users. And I think it's becoming very clear that when we're planning to engage on urban design and public realm and active travel, we need to also engage with the people who are supporting projects. An awful lot of energy is spent on engaging with people who object, who have concerns. And that's not to say to ignore that. But sometimes, you know, it can be 10, 15, 20% who are objecting, 80% who support, and they're not getting the attention. And I, and I think that needs to be rebalanced. Uh, engagement and collaboration, areas that need development, I think community engagement with different stakeholders like children, older people, disability groups, um, non-governmental organizations. I think it's really important to see how we can do that. So it could be PPNs, for example. Um, and public health stakeholders, we're not in, as engaged with them as we need to be, and it's something that I've, I'm doing quite a bit of work on at the moment, working with the Climate and Health Alliance. So looking at what is the impact of, of low air quality, of noise, of the lack of physical activity. Things that we're going to have to deal with going forward is heat stress. It's very much a, a, a feature in, on the continent, but during the heat waves during the summer, there were many people in our society who would have struggled with that. And what about the trauma of climate change related events? It's something that's becoming clear, seeing all these images on the screen or experiencing flooding or, or heat waves or fires or whatever the case may be. And we may be saved from the worst ravages of that. And, and that would be a great thing, but people are still seeing it. Maybe we'll be experiencing an element of it. Academic engagement and research is really important. And there's really an emerging area now on collaboration with social enterprise and corporate social responsibility. And I think, there's probably a third way for local authorities and private enterprise to sort of work together, but through social enterprise. It has always been difficult to square that off. And I'll give you an example of one of the projects we're working on in DLR that points to the possibilities there. And I think I'm very hopeful about a new generation that's coming, children that are there, um, graduates who are coming out of college. I really think that there's a, a strong desire to serve the public good. And unfortunately for them, they're going to have to remedy many mistakes that we've made. And in our generation and in, in previous generations, and I think we need, we need to do the best to give them the best opportunity to adapt to the changes that will come for them. And this is just a, an engagement uh, model that we use in DLR. We use it for our after school travel. And we use it for coastal route and a lot of our projects last year. And I've included this because I think most of you will be aware that there is legislation proposed trialing to succeed based on UK legislation, as I understand it, with experimental traffic regulation orders, which will link into active travel, but also important in terms of urban design. And um, so we have to watch this space. Um, we'll have to see what the, the legislation looks like in the first place and, and when it might be put in place. There's, there's no timeline as yet. And just some of the projects that we're working on in DLR. This is a new initiative we're working on. It's called Safe and Quiet Streets. Um, so we're working on it with our, our partners, our advisors, Ramble, uh, the Danish consultants. And this is very much you know, it's a pilot project. We're looking at two locations in DLR. It's a collaborative approach with, with the local community, local residents in particular. Uh, it's engagement that takes time. And the aim is to develop trust and confidence. So we work with communities. We look at their areas. We look at the challenges that they have. We also look at the opportunities that are there. Because I think oftentimes people just look at, well, there's rat running going on, there's parking on the footpaths. But sometimes they miss that they have a nice green space or that they have trees along the road or that they are near to amenities or, uh, or parks. And it's aimed at the street and neighborhood level. It's not for, let's say, a cell or a large part of, of a town or village. Um, so we're working on that and hopefully that would be and we will have a project on the ground, I would say, in the coming months. 
the other project we're working on, which we're really excited about, is what we're calling Love Our Laneways. And uh, we're working with a playful city, a social enterprise. Some of you may know them. We're working with others, including the IADP, uh, Sainagan College of Further Education. So it's a pilot project. And it's sort of modeled and inspired by the Rural Guard in uh, Montreal. So these are these green uh, laneways, you know, where you take all the dilapidated, run down laneways running at the back of houses and you turn them into something more lively, more vibrant, more diverse, including greening. It might have active travel routes. It might not. It might just have rest areas for, for the local community. Um, the important thing is that it's community led. And for our project, it's facilitated by Playful City. And the solutions aren't predetermined uh, and they emerge through the engagement process. So you're not starting out with, well, it has to have an active travel route or it has to have trees or whatever. Actually, the, com the community work on it and they decide in conjunction with, with ourselves what will happen. I mean, we will have the budget for it and so on, but we're trying to leave a lot more of the control, the input to them. And I think in the long term, that's actually helpful for the capacity in local communities. A lot of established uh, estates would have residence groups and residence associations in a lot of areas that we're focused on. They may be former council estates and they don't have that capacity. They don't have those networks. And this is a way of building that up. And hopefully when the laneways are, are put in place or the changes are made, they'll accept them and maybe even maintain them, change them uh, in the way that they, they, they would like to. And then just some final thoughts. Um, as I said, I don't think you need to be an urban designer to appreciate urban design. And everyone can't be so, but it's it's really important that we have architects and urban designers involved in our projects, in our active travel projects, because they're able to look at elements that maybe an engineer or, um, or another professional mightn't be able to look at. Important to work across disciplines and departments to get the best outcome. And good quality public realm um, needs to be integrated with traffic, active travel. And this is a really critical point because oftentimes the reasons why active travel schemes fail is because of the public realm elements or the visual. It's a load of bollards or a load of curves that have just been put through a town or a village, maybe even a heritage village. And in time, the public there begin to resent them. So you really need to pay attention to that. Um, we need to engage with all stakeholders, not just the vocal minority. And we really need to give energy and attention to those who support as well as those who object. Um, be proactive, proactive in communicating and my view is you shouldn't be afraid to defend and promote your project. I mean, you believe in the project, then promote it, defend it. It's not for everybody, but I think it does help. And it helps to push back on, on misinformation or uh, people who object with no good basis. Um, we need to upskill our communication and engagement and bring on board specialists if needed. I'm really looking at this more and more now, and I think there is a strong role for community engagement specialists because they're independent as well, and they may be able to facilitate more difficult uh, interactions with, let's say, communities who are object, objecting fairly strenuously to, to changes. Have a strategy, sell that vision and plan and implement it. Easy to say, but you need to start with the strategy first. And local authorities and state agencies will need to take a lead and be brave. And I, I feel very strongly about this because local authorities often are the exemplars, um, you know, in terms of uh, climate action or um, the transportation projects, but on active travel and urban design, local authorities like the one I'm in, state agencies like the NTA, PII, are going to need to take a lead and be brave. And to be blunt about it, it isn't going to be private consultants who do that. They will need to get a strong steer from their client organizations as to what is possible, what they can live with, um, because I don't think they're in a position to make those decisions. And just to finish off, um, picture of Dundrum is a really pretty location that we, we changed and altered last year in that village, just beside the Pembroke Colleges. And the photograph on the right is just a reminder that while we focus on urban design in the project today, it is, it is actually about protecting people who want to quite reasonably walk or cycle to wherever they're going, particularly to school. And that um, cycleway there, two-way cycleways on Carysford Avenue, and it leads right down to Carysford National School. And a baseline survey from May, we, we, we established that 90% of the children are going to that school are either walking or cycling. So less than 10% are actually being driven to school, which is a phenomenal uh, statistic. And I think goes to show two things. One, uh, safe routes to school, safe infrastructure is really important and can promote that. And two, that 
schools who are proactive, principals, boards of management, parents' association to promote um, the walking and cycling to school can bring about those outcomes along with local authorities to provide the infrastructure. So that's all from me. And I think I'll just hand you over to Andres now. Thank you. Oh, and it's the urban around. I'm going to be presenting the urban around in the Bus Connect uh, project and projects. Um, and as mentioned, my name is Andreas Sol Rotner. I'm an architect. I'm originally from Denmark, having lived here now in Dublin uh, for about 10 years. I am a senior project manager for the urban realm at the ANTA. And I have been working on primarily the last two years, the Bus Connect uh, project um, on, on the uh, urban realm spaces there. Um, just a little bit uh, quickly, it'll be mostly project examples, just very quickly active um, on active travel. Uh, obviously, it's it's traveling with a purpose, using your own energy, and um, if you uh, this is very much considered in context of commuter movement of people. So that's the daily traffic that we need to get people up and down the roads for their various purposes. Um, and active travel modes, primary modes are obviously walking and cycling. There are some smaller modes that include scooters and rollerblades. Again, non-motorized I've put in here, the discussion can obviously be where is something like a motorized scooter. Uh, currently, it wouldn't be part of the active travel definition because you're not using your own energy on that. At the, the NTA, we do have uh, some active travel projects. Um, uh, they include the reallocation of overall road space to include segregated cycling lanes and widened footpaths, um, obviously to benefit the active travel modes. We also include cyclist parking, race pedestrian crossings to make uh, crossing of uh, road safer, reducing road width of crossing points and other improvements. Um, just shortly on the Bus Connects project, um, the, we are trying to, it's, um, it's about, Buses. It's part of the bus uh, network reconfiguration uh, that was done and is being implemented at the moment. As part of that, um, certain core bus corridors were identified where uh, physical infrastructural works would be needed to ensure the bus priority on those routes. It's about journey time saving, but it's also about journey time reliability. Uh, so you don't go out and catch a bus catch your bus one day and it takes 15 minutes and it might take 45 minutes the next day. And um, that you can always say, well, if I take the bus, it takes 25 minutes for me to get from A to B uh, because the bus doesn't get stuck in the traffic. It's also about pedestrians and the urban realm and it's about better cycling facilities. We'll get to that in a minute. And um, just the facts at a glance there, we have 230 kilometers of bus priority. And we have around 200 kilometers of cycle lanes and tracks that will be segregated. It's part of a larger system there. You can see some of the other points further down on that slide. It's obviously the Dublin area bus network redesign, and it includes um, an upgrade to the ticketing system, uh, upgrading to upgrading the buses and new bus stops and shelters, uh, etc. Just to give you an overview of the corridors that were identified, uh, important to note here that there isn't end-to-end -end construction going on on these routes. This is where the network identified that priority is needed or wanted. Um, and priority does exist on a lot of the network already. So it's important to understand that in the, the construction work that we're planning for doesn't include every kilometer of that way. And therefore, a lot of places, changes aren't happening. And so it's not like building a railway. It's not like building a motorway where you're, where you're just um, going end to end with one construction and one cross section. And um, main objectives is important here. Uh, facility Facilitating a modal shift from vehicle to um, public transport and cycling, improving the public transport accessibility across the city and deliver a more attractive, reliable, convenient bus system and deliver safe and segregated cycling facilities along each corridor. So there are our main objectives on the project and 
Obviously, it's based on some of the work that has been done in the Project Ireland 2040 uh, and, and other work identifying that the bus is the option for public transport in Dublin. And that is uh, the basis of the uh, CBC work that we're doing. Just a bit on the urban realm, walking and cycling along each route, uh, we are hoping to make, or we are making an improvement and enhancements to footpaths, walkways, crossings, green areas um, and, and the infrastructure works facilitate inclusion of enhanced cycling facilities, as mentioned, and it's drawn on the Greater Dublin Area Cycle Network Plan. And um, as I said, we don't need to work end to end uh, to create the objectives or reach the objectives along the full route. So uh, the urban realm improvement opportunities, they present themselves um, through the physical works needed to reach the objectives. Um, and all put together, the, the, the schemes provide an opportunity for lots of minor interventions um, on the urban realm that could give a general citywide lift. Just a little bit on the cross section, this was the cross section uh, sort of simplified that that will show uh, space for all users where there's bus priority, but there's still space for the private uh, vehicle traffic, uh, segregated cycle lanes and footpaths with room for trees. So that cross section uh, obviously doesn't fit in everywhere. And that's part of what the presentation is about. I'll just go through some uh, uh, some of the, just need to get my notes up, hold on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get that. Just give me two seconds. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh, yeah, so on the uh, right, you can see uh, Rathmines Main Street, um, where um, we couldn't and didn't want to implement the, the typical cross section. We obviously the footpaths needed to be left uh, nice and wide there for uh, for the attraction of, of uh, the commercial areas and the shops that are there, and we wanted to create obviously better segregated cycling lanes. I hope you can see the existing photo down there on the corner, where it's the uh, the, the magic white lines indicating that you can cycle here. So the priority for the buses are um, obtained by creating bus gates in the um, uh, either end of um, uh, the main street there to to make sure it's buses only up and down that uh, road. Um, some commercial traffic allowed, and it's a time plated uh, option. Um, and the left, you can see some of the opportunities we have to enhancements of um, of an area where there already is good opportunities for for uh, for act for uh, for urban realm with the square or the plaza there on the top uh, of the picture that we have the opportunity in a project like this to to enhance and um, and make it a, a may, uh, just to update the quality on it basically. Um, just some plans of the same um, um, same uh, um, area there. Um, yeah, I wish I could zoom in a little bit here, but it just shows you the spaces allocated. And obviously, on a on a um, on a road like uh, Rathmines on the main street, we there'd be a lot of um, um, dropping off of of goods to the various shops. So we had to take that into account with creating some areas where commercial vehicles could come and unload. Um, another option here, this is in uh, Stony Batter, um, existing view uh, looking north towards the existing plaza that are there. Again, we see uh, plenty of room for cars. There is a bus lane already. There is some cycle provision provided, but again, it's just painted lines on the road. What we're uh, planning to do is um, recreate uh, or change the layout uh, using bus gates and redirecting private traffic to achieve cross sections on the road that prioritize cycle lanes and footpaths. And the cars in this uh, option coming from the south will not be able to follow the road in the fork up to the right. They need to go up left and cars coming up from Capra and um, coming down will not be able to 
continue further down south, that'll be buses only going down that road. Uh, so you can't access the southern part. So that provides us with the opportunity to, to, to keep quite the quite wide uh, footpaths that are there, but create some um, segregated cycling lanes. And um, obviously in a place like this, there's already good space for, for the plaza. And again, the project provides an opportunity to update that space and, and uh, help create a really nice um, um, urban square there. Um, uh, yeah. I'll continue here. Here is a slightly simpler. That was a little bit of a high point or a hot spot up in Stony Bada. But again, the project goes through a lot of more, let's say, an anonymous areas. Here we are on the Lucan Road along the Hermitage uh, Golf Club, where there isn't any cycling option going into town. And we are providing uh, that cycling option. And that is going to happen by taking some space on the left. Uh, through CPO measures uh, but in, yeah, and therefore creating uh, the cycle lanes that can provide the safe cycling along here and also giving space to uh, pedestrians. Um, that is a plan of it and how it uh, functions and you can see there's a, a, a quite a large green area that was on the left of the uh, image you saw before. Uh, so we can provide quite a, a strong presence of that green, um, uh, you can say, barrier um, for the for the space behind the, the main road. Um, coming up to another option of where we're changing um, from existing car prioritized um, junction uh, spaces and a lot of roundabouts on this projects and um, that the project meets are being changed to um, to uh, um, uh, junctions where because primarily of the safety of pedestrians and cyclists it is hard and tricky for cyclists especially to navigate their way around a, um, a roundabout like this um, interestingly for this area there were some local concerns in the trees in the middle of that roundabout as it was considered a gateway feature to and, and into this area. And so you can say the roundabout does have that little uh, positive aspect that it can create in the center of it. And a feature that, that can be quite visible and recognizable, but the priority for us have been to prioritize cyclists and pedestrians and, and create a much safer um, uh, space uh, for everyone. And uh, with the urban rail improvements, um, here we can up, we can and with much tightening tightening in the space for the motorized traffic and the and the area they have we can create uh, opportunity much better opportunity for planting etc on a on a junction like this and um, here we're on the long mile road uh, the long mile road obviously busy it already has um some actually urban realm qualities with the with the center and um, uh, with the green center um, running down between the two lanes and um, there won't be two lanes for traffic but one lane for traffic and and obviously one lane for buses and again we can segregate the the the, the cycling here and uh, what we've also then done is that we have updated the, the schools crossing points there we can see an image here um with with raised tables um and to to make it much safer for, for uh, the, the crossing of the roads and may, by making um, places like this safer where you have to cross quite a wide road and uh, two lanes of traffic either side, there still will be with the buses and the private uh, vehicle lane and make it safer and therefore hopefully encourage um, uh, the walking to school uh, for both parents and children um, on a higher level than maybe there is today. Um, uh, again, that's going to have a good few examples that are like this, but that is it's because we, in the Corpus Corridor project, this is what we do. We follow the, um, the arterial, the traffic arteries that, that are bringing important traffic in and out of, of uh, Dublin. And the urban realm that we have tried to create is in connection with how do we manage that. So here's another good example. We're in up at the New Nanger Road. A junction with extremely generous um, turning movements for vehicles, as you can see on the right, um, 
you know, for the for the quick movement of vehicles and, and, and the quick, I'm sure it's a junction that functions very, very well because no cars are stuck on the, a lot of cars won't be stuck on the red lights here. But the priority for, for the project as we have it is the bus priority and and the, the priority for cyclists and pedestrians. So by tightening in the junction, making the corners of it meet much closer um, towards the middle, and you can create a much safer environment for, for, uh, for cycling and pedestrians. Um, so I might be repeating myself a little bit here, but it's just to show that this is what is happening on the cor bus corridor project along the, the the, the various routes and the 230 kilometers that we are working with. Here, I wanted to show an example of where it may be a little bit difficult. Um, we have a very narrow cross section here, and there's some heritage housing sort of jutting out. You can see on the top left part, um, the, the houses that are sitting there, just at top where it says Malaha Road and to the left. Uh, um, so there, there were no option to, to um, and we didn't want to take out of the green space if we could avoid. Uh, so an option on, in a place like this is to, is to possibly use uh, and go in behind uh, the green space here. Uh, and where we created the cycle lane going north, as it is north, it would be to the left here. Um, going north where we where we bring in cyclists and pedestrians in behind obviously as in a solution like this it, it's going to require very good detailing very good lighting to make sure that we get um, get it as user friendly as possible uh, when moving away from from uh, the, this the softer traffic as i would call it cyclists and uh, the pedestrians the active travel when we move them away from from running just along the um, the, the motorized traffic um, an example here from Donnybrook Road, um, as you can see, there is on this one a bus lane in one direction going south, um, and um, again we needed to in a very tight space, very tight cross section there, the old Kylie's pub, um, if anyone would know that, um, where the road does this kind of S turn. Um, we again we wanted to prioritize the cycle lanes the segregated cycle lanes and um, uh, something to be noticed here is that um side roads access and that's something that's common across the project side road access uh, into the main roads have been downgraded uh, for the motorized traffic for the cars and upgraded for the crossing of pedestrians and cyclists that come along the main route. And that has been an important urban realm feature along the project and along all of the routes um, and has been implemented in the designs as they stand. Um, another tricky one here, uh, Phippsburg Road, uh, where um, it's an example of the an offline cycle solution on a very narrow cross section on the Phippsburg Road and um, unmovable build structures on either side um, and um, having to keep uh, the, the traffic lanes and the bus lanes in, uh, it, it was often that we can create a very attractive cycle route that runs along the Phippsburg Road, accessed from the south and near, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, well, up from the north, it's, it's uh, accessed um, from the canal where you come in and um, behind was the library and um, up on the left. and. Part of that is then that we're saying that on the uh, North Circular Road, the North Circular Road actually is up on a ridge or on a high there that we create a bridge for the road uh, so we can cut, cut the active travel access under that bridge and, 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 and help create some really interesting urban realm along that route. Um, I'll try and finish up here now. This is an example um, from the Oberdom Condor Road. Um, hopefully you can see that the image up on the left. It's very much the cross section as it as it as as it is to be ideal, but again, we have made much safer the active travel modes, especially the cycling here. That was part of the traffic, the the painted white lines, uh, and are now up uh, behind a curb. And just that action there creates and and enhances the the urban realm on a very important artery up to the uh, to the airport. 
or the, uh, on a busy road, it's not probably not going to be less busy, but it's going to be safer and, and um, pedestrians are going to feel further away from the traffic. A um, few last examples here. Uh, again, hopefully you can see the before road, a busy junction with the Kappa road. Um, and the, the idea is we tighten up uh, the junction so not so much asphalt is given over to cars and much less, much more space is allocated for the pedestrians and the cycling, creating opportunities for wider footpaths and opportunities for more green and planted areas. And I'll try and finish up here with two or three more examples. Bally Fermat, an example of where for the priority of cycling and, and pedestrians as well. Again, we opted for, for a solution that provides a one-way road uh, for the motorized traffic and, and the, with redirected traffic uh, for, for the other direction. Um, this is a plan of how it functions with the shopping area um, up towards um, what's called Coal Park there. Uh, in behind that, um, I, I think I'm just going to finish now because I have a few more examples here again, Clan Brasso Street or New Street. Um, simple measures put in um, the segregated cycleway to make it safer. Um, on for, here's an example on the Rathgar Road where we've opted for uh, a one-way system as well. And this is not just for the benefit, uh, as you can see in the cross section, for the benefit of the cyclist and the, uh, the footpath, but also that on a road like this, this is a before and after image. Uh, there aren't any actually street trees on this. All the green on this road is provided from the growth that happens in the private gardens. And by keeping the cross section narrow, not going in and CPOing and cutting into people's gardens, we, 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 we can help keep the as much green as possible. Uh, again, last example, I believe it is here, um, Pembroke Road uh, into our town we use the bus gate solution so as to not squeeze the active travel part of the cross section and uh, yeah that's it and i will uh, stop sharing